as happens uh, most of the time, many of you last week left by these back stairs. I don't know if you're trying to get exercise or don't want to shake my hand as I as you leave, or I don't know, but one man, one man said, Paul, that lecture reminded me of the peace and love of God. And I must say, I was pretty happy. I was pretty happy about that because none of you, ten years, have ever said anything like that before. And so I, I started to fish for some more compliment. And I asked him how the lecture reminded him of the peace and love of God. And he said, well, it reminded me of the peace of God because it passed all human understanding. <laughs> and it reminded me of the love of God because it endured forever. <laughs> and I was going to make a resolution to talk less, but I'm not going to start that tonight. <laughs> you know, every day on the, on, the, on the news we see countries that are they're torn apart by conflict. The news is filled with, with protest with riots, with debates. We're, we're, we're constantly bombarded by commentators in our own country who, who point to the evils of government, the mismanagement of government. And no matter what side of the political spectrum we're on, there are certain things that each of us would like to see changed. I think more so than any point in our history, so many of us are cynical about government. I'm not going to say who it was, but it was a president just a few years ago. And his aide, trusted aide, came up and said, Mr. President, I was wondering if it might be possible for my son to work somewhere in the White House. Of course, answered the president. What does he do? And the aide simply threw up his hands and said nothing. And the president said, well, that's great. We won't even have to train him. <laughs> wow, this is a tough crowd tonight. <laughs> It's tempting, is it not, to, to adopt an adversarial role towards those in authority over us? Definitely it's tempting. But according to Paul, it's also wrong. How many of us here tonight believe that when God says something, when God says something, He means for you and I to be obedient to what He says? Without a show of hands, just in your own heart, how many of you have said something about the current president or maybe the past president that was negative. No, no show of hands. I don't want to have to start shooting some of you. Let me tell you what God says. Exodus 22. You shall not revile God nor curse a ruler of your people. What about Paul? Paul says in Acts 23. You shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. If you remember a, a chapter 12, it, I think it's kind of strange that Paul moves from, from how to make friends of your enemies, if you remember the end of chapter 12, to how to, to submit to governing authorities. But it's not as strange as you might think, if you, if you contemplate it for just a moment. In Paul's day, though, this was radical teaching, these first seven verses. Paul was a Roman citizen, but he was also what? Jewish. And most Jews, if you remember, viewed the Romans in those days as, as oppressors who occupied their land. I think it'd be safe to think that most of Jews of Paul's day viewed the Romans like the Jews of our day view the Palestinians. However, Paul encourages the believers, new believers, to be supportive of the state rather than take the approach of the zealots who constantly oppose the, the state. In our, in our verses to, tonight, we're going to see why that's important. Paul gives us some important principles that should serve as the foundation of our submission to earthly authorities. Anybody know the origin of Uncle Sam? The term Uncle Sam? The most commonly accepted is the fact that in 1812, Samuel Wilson was a meat packer, and he provided meat to the U.S. Army. And the meat shipments were stamped to keep it straight in the warehouse with the initials U.S. And one day someone, one of the warehouse workers, joked that the, that the initials stood for Uncle Sam. And that eventually led, most people believe, most historians believe, led to the idea of, of Uncle Sam symbolizing our U.S. government. We talk a lot about government today, don't we? A man was walking down a dark street one late one night and all of a sudden a robber jumped out 
with a gun. He said, give me all your money. The man replies, I can't. You can't do this to me. I'm a U.S. congressman. The robber then simply says, then give me all my money. <laughs> now the politicians have their own way of looking at it, don't they? You know, there's a story about a reporter. He asked a politician how he felt after losing a big election. The politician replied this. I feel like the preacher who went out to convert the cannibals. They listened very intently to him and then they ate him. <laughs> Romans 13 is a, is a central New Testament passage concerning how you and I as Christians ought to relate to human government. And how apropos is it in this day and this time of our nation. I want to tell you frankly before we start that when I'm through, you're still going to have a lot of questions. I'm not going to stand up and shake hands tonight. Because I don't have all the answers. No, I'm going to be talking to someone tonight. My wife, no. This passage will answer some questions and it will raise others in the process. I, I will agree with you. Perhaps you saw that in your discussion groups tonight. But rather than try to answer every possible question you might have, I'm going to lay out the broad, perhaps the teaching of the passage and leave with you with the responsibility to fill in the blanks on your own. And he lays Paul right, right, right away. We go right to the heart. He lays the, an important principle right down. Submit yourself, or let me, let me say this, there's no authority except which God has established. Simply meant authority, whether it's good or bad, Republican or Democrat, has been established by God. You've got to understand that. We're going to come from that principle tonight. Paul's not alone either. Let me tell you what Peter writes. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every authority instituted among men, whether to the king as the supreme authority or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. 1 Peter 2, 13 through 17. Now neither of those guys, Peter or Paul, tell us that, that God has established every, only every authority that you and I agree with. Or only those authorities that we believe are good. We're told what? That God, look at the word, every authority. Every authority. There's no one today in a position of authority that is in not some sense representing God in their service. You've got, you got to go back and look. Remember in Paul's day, who was king? Nero. Now he was a crazy guy. You know anything about him? Paul said that even though he's crazy, even though we know what he has done to us as Christians, you ought to serve him, obey him, and pray for him. God can still work through godless leaders, I promise you. The word established, the Lord established government for the what? For the purpose of keeping order in society and reining in the sinful nature of you and I. If we didn't have the government, think about it. If we didn't have the government, there'd be no public utilities, no military, no police force, no public aid. We'd have no assurance that our food sources would be safe. There'd be no court system. And even though we're disappointed often with the way that the courts rule, it's still better than what? It's better than anarchy. Without government, think about this, without government defending the powerless and protecting the little guy, society would, would basically victimize the weak. You see, God ordained government for the public good and to restrain the sinful nature of you and I. We ought to respect those in authority because God designed those authorities to help us. The word authority is broad, is it not? It's the Greek word what? It starts with an E. Pay attention. Exousia. Right? See? Which means what? Right or privilege. An authority is anyone who has the right to do something. It gives you the right, the authority, the right to make certain decisions. And, 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 and seen in another light, an authority is anyone who has the right to make decisions that directly affect your life and mine. And in the passage, Paul's thinking about human government rulers, kings and queens, emperors, presidents, dictators, potentates of every variety. 
Paul is not thinking about one particular, though some preach this, one particular form of government, such as democracy or monarchy or socialism or dictatorship. He's only saying that American democracy is ordained by God. He's speaking in broad general terms about human government in the, everywhere in the world. The institution of government comes from the hand of God. And again, who was in power when Paul wrote this? Do you remember? What did I just say? Nero, what? He hated Christians. you remember? Remember that he rounded Christians up? He had them dipped in wax. He had them tied to stakes. And then he lit them. And they served as lanterns for his festivities. Human lanterns. And Paul is saying here, and so we got to think, let me go back a minute, we got to think about how wicked and pagan Rome was. Abortion flourished during those days. Homosexuality was accepted as normal. Masses were required. The people were required to worship Caesar as Lord. Sorcery and black magic abounded. No government has ever been as pagan as the government of Rome. Yet Paul still says during this time that all authority comes from God. Then he gave what? The explicit directive. Be subject to the governing authorities. No ifs, no ands, no buts. Be subject to the governing authorities. Nothing about whether Nero was a Christian or a pagan. Just the word submit. It's a familiar word. should be. It's used over 50 times in the New Testament. It means to voluntarily follow the direction of those in authority over you. Submission is not the same as obedience, though they're related. Obedience relates to our outward performance, while submission touches the attitude of our heart toward those who are over us, who have authority over us. And, and that distinction is, is central, it's critical, because you've got to realize you may not always be able to pray, or be able, I'm sorry, to obey those who are over you. But you can have a heart of submission. Submission means that believing, I think a simple definition is submission means believing that God is able to accomplish His will in your life and mine through those that He has placed over us. Submission. It focuses. What does that do? It focuses the attention on God and not on me. Not on the person over you. The most important thing is the attitude of our hearts. God takes responsibility for rising up one leader and putting down another. Scripture says that. Psalm 75, no one from the east or the west or from the desert can exalt a man. But it is God who judges. He brings one down, He exalts another up. He stands behind the ballot box and behind the armies that march and the navies that sail. He's the unseen hand at work in the nations of the world. Plain and simple. That means George Washington came to power by the hand of God. So did Abraham Lincoln, Teddy Roosevelt, Harry Truman, Dwight Eisenhower. God installed John F. Kennedy. And later he was replaced by Lyndon Johnson. That applied to Richard Nixon, to Gerald Ford, Jimmy Carter, to Ronald Reagan, to George Bush. It also applies to Barack Obama and Donald Trump. And as Christians you have to believe that. It's what God's Word says every authority whether you like them or not there does come a time when civil obedience disobedience is in order when the state comes to the place of, of trying to get you and I to govern or to, to do things contrary I should say to God's law when the, when the laws of the state contradict the laws of God then the state is not to be obeyed. When, it, when, you, when obeying the law, the state, makes you violate the clear teaching of God's Word, and you, not, you ought to have a clear understanding of God's Word, not what you've been told, but what God's Word says, 
then God's to be obeyed, not the state. You, gotta, you need to remember in these politically charged times, when God comes back, He ain't going to be riding a donkey. He's not going to be riding an elephant. He's not going to be a Republican. He's not going to be a Democrat. He's not going to be an Independent. He's neither. His vote is the only one that counts. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. Paul simply draws a simple conclusion here. To rebel against authority is to bring judgment on yourself. It means judgment by God, and I think it is certainly means judgment by what? By the authority that's over you. Just try mouthing off the next time you get stopped. I was taken by, by a policeman. I was taken back when, when Bill Williams asked Dr. Froberg if, he, if it was true he got a speeding ticket. I mean, if you know Dr. Froberg's driving habits, he doesn't believe there's anything over four on the speedometer. I've been behind him. Okay? But now if you don't think that's true, get either get behind him or bow off to a police officer next time. Might find yourself spending the night in jail. Isn't that what the Bellmead Bible says, Sheriff? Okay. You, when, and the simple principle is when you are resisting government, you are resisting God. You see, an ex submission to government is simply an, is a, is a, an expression of your submission to God. It's what, what God's Word says. And whether or not you think a law is fair or not, you've got no right to simply disobey it because of your preferences. According to Paul, all human authorities exist to do two things. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of, though, of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is what? A servant, mentioned that twice, servant of God. An avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. I think right here we see that Paul introduces us to the ministry of government. And I think that word perhaps to some of you seems odd because ministry, we often associate that with what happens on Sunday morning, right? Twice in verse 4 he says what? That their rulers are what? Servants of God. He doesn't necessarily mean they're saved, but that human authorities serve the purpose of God on earth. Think about that for a moment. The police officer who patrols your neighborhood is God's servant. The police officer who stops you because you're speeding is God's servant. The IRS agent who audits your return is not God's agent. No, it is God's agent. <laughs> President Trump is God's servant. And so is Putin of Russia. For that matter, so is the stupid guy, I'm sorry, so is the gentleman who rules Iran. The same is true for every human leader. Doesn't say, doesn't make any difference. God's Word, that's what I believe, that's the only thing I can go by. Every authority. Does it not say that? Everyone must submit to the government, for, for there is no authority except from God. No. We have to treat our leaders with respect. Christians ought to lead the way in showing honor to those who are in authority. Because you need to understand that what? They are appointed by God. Why? We're not going to understand. You know, that touches all of us when we see folks that we're not, we don't approve of making decisions that seem to be evil. There is a time though when we must speak out in favor of what is right and against what is wrong. But no matter what stirs us up, even when I think of life and death issues that are at stake, at, at, at stake, when I am speaking about those in authority, I'm speaking about those representatives of God Almighty. Are you afraid of those who are over you? Don't be. Because what Scripture says, do right and you'll have nothing to fear. He's, but Paul is immediately talking about an ideal situation. 
But the, tra- but the principle holds true. You see, troublemakers get in trouble w- while those who play by the rules most often don't. In a fallen world, sometimes things get turned upside down. But it's better to be a law-abiding citizen because criminals do eventually get caught. If you don't think that's the case, look at our prison system. It's overflowing. They're building them faster than we can... That we're, we're putting them in there faster than they can build them. Did you notice the reference to the sword? It represents the punishing power of the state. In ancient Rome, the sword <coughs> was used in warfare and in capital punishment. According to tradition, Paul himself <coughs> experienced the cruelty of the Roman sword when Nero had him beheaded. The reference to the sword here provides the Christian basis, I believe, for service in the armed forces, as well as the justification at times for capital punishment. God says that the, that the state does have the right to take life, not capriciously or unjustly, but in certain cases. He does not bear the sword in vain. That's what it says. And it simply ends with a... And some of you are going to argue with me about that, and I'll be glad to show you where you're wrong. <laughs> but the passage ends with a statement about the Christian's duty to support the government. He gives us a twofold reason. Therefore, one must be in subjects not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. We support human government because what? Because of wrath, meaning we fear punishment if we don't. That's why you slow down. That's why I slowed down. Because I crested the hill and there was Woodway stopped on the side. Lawbreakers will be brought to justice. Second, we we, we support government because of our conscience. That's because we know that God stands behind every human government working out His will for you and I. That means anarchy, men, is never an option. We may disagree. We may vote away. We may vote against a certain person at the ballot box. We may pick it. We may write letters. But we must never join the ranks of the anarchists. Be more specific. Christians ought to be known. You and I as law-abiding citizens. And we may disagree even strongly and passionately. But we should not ever resort to violence. For the same reason you also pay taxes for the authorities or ministers of God. Attend to the very thing to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed to them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. A man was on vacation strolling outside his hotel in Acapulco, enjoying the sunny Mexican weather. Suddenly he was attracted by the screams of a woman kneeling in front of a child. The man knew just enough Spanish to determine the child had swallowed a coin. And seizing by the, the, the child by his back, he gave him a couple thrusts on his back and an American quarter dropped out on the sidewalk. The woman said, the mother said, oh, thank you, Lord. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. You seem just to know how to, you, just, you seem to know just how to get it out of him. Sir, are you a doctor? He said, no, ma'am. I'm with the United States Internal Revenue Service. <laughs> These verses are so clear they need little comment and I'm almost out of time. <laughs> Paul calls human... I learned that from... A... Anyway, I won't tell you where I learned that from. But Paul calls... you like that? These verses are so clear. I know some of you would like me to come in here, have an opening prayer and say, guys, these verses are so clear. Let's go home. It ain't going to be tonight though. <laughs> Paul calls, calls human rulers what? Ministers of God. And as, and, as, and as such, what do they deserve? They deserve four things from us. Taxes, revenue, respect, and honor. We, we may think we're heavily taxed. Heavily taxed. I think we are. But you've got to remember back in Paul's day, Rome had an income tax, a head tax, a poll tax, a road tax, a wagon tax, a crop tax, an import tax, an export tax, a harbor tax, and a bridge tax, as well as some midway taxes to name a few. <laughs> The Caesars there in those days loved to live in style. And it cost a lot of money to maintain that huge empire. So they taxed the people heavily in order to pay for all that. 
But paying taxes, Paul says, is a Christian duty. Tax evasion, whether you cheat a little bit here or cheat a little bit there, is a crime, number one. But it's also a sin. Honor refers to your realization, man, that God places value and significance upon such people. Did you look at that? Paul does not qualify the word all. He uses that word all. All civil servants at every level are to, re- are to receive our honor and respect. It's not just for the office, but it's for the person as well. It's regardless of their party affiliation, regardless of how they live their private life, But perhaps tonight, as perhaps some of you since November, believe that you can't honor the president or our governor. Well, let me ask you, if you can't, I understand. But could you pray for him? Could you pray for him? And as you pray for that person or people, I think you'll find that it's easier to honor those in authority. Because you've got to remember who put them there. Remember this, men, we got dual citizenship. Here and there. God establishes government leaders, and our duty is not limited to those who, whose political or personal behavior we approve of. And as a Christian, are we faithfully fulfilling our duty to earthly government? While we're, while we're living here, as a city, I mean as a citizen of a heavenly, heavenly kingdom to come. Thank you guys for your attention. Thank you for listening. I'll be glad to answer any questions, just not tonight. I see some of you just shaking your head. Just go back to God's word, that's all I ask you. Let's go to the Lord in prayer.